Hey everybody, it's Eric Hayden and Bell Melendez here with the Weather Service in Newport Moorhead City. It's just before one o'clock. Uh, we're gonna do a couple housekeeping items. Then Bell's gonna start off here in a minute with the presentation on Coco Raws. And then I'll talk to you again at the end. Um, if this is the first webinar you've done, you can ask us questions through the webinar itself. All you need to do is go to the questions part. Uh, we'll get those questions, nobody else sees them. And then Bell and I will answer those at the end. If you have a microphone, it doesn't have to be a fancy one like this. If you're watching us on a mo mobile device like this, you have a microphone. You can raise your hand at the end of the class and we'll call on you and take questions from you. So we wanna try to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, we've actually done these online classes for a couple years now. Bell has done some Coco Raws classes and we've done some weather spotter classes. Uh, so we're pretty versed with the classes themselves. Uh, the difference is this year with our current situation, we've expanded the classes. And at the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about more classes that we have coming up, including hurricane preparedness, a tropical sky warn, and also a flood sky warn as we get into the month of April. So right now it's a one o'clock. So if Bell's all set, uh, Bell's gonna be doing the first part of this Coco Ross presentation. I'll be kind of hanging back and monitoring any questions. And again, we'll take those at the end. So Bell, you are all good to go. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today uh, for our online Kokoraz training. Uh, this training is for people who recently joined uh, Kokoraz or simply they just want to get a refresher course on Kokoraz or simply and lastly is if you want to know more about Kokoraz before you actually join. Um, as Eric ended up mentioning before, if you have any questions um, as you go, um, feel free to, um, we have an option in your screen to um, put a question and we'll take those questions at the end. Um, feel, as I mentioned, feel free and um, no one will see your questions. It's only gonna be uh, more Eric than myself as he's kind of controlling everything um, from his end. But by all means, go ahead. All right, so let's begin. Okay, hold on. Okay, so if you can't see me on camera, um, you'll see me here. I'm the person actually on the left-hand side, and as I mentioned, my name is Bell Melendez, and I'm actually one of the coordinators uh, for COCORAZ. Um, Just in general terms, um, um, when it comes down to COCORAZ, everyone has a coordinator somewhere with, throughout the United States. Um, I'm just representing right now Eastern North Carolina, because that's a section that you know we represent um, right now. So once you sign up for Kokoraz, you will have a regional coordinator either contacting you or that you could contact them for any additional questions. But in respects to Eastern North Carolina, I'm actually one of the coordinators. Um, so feel free to give me an email, um, shoot me an email if you have any questions or any concerns. Also to your top um, right hand side, you have Shane Kearns. He's also another our how call it regional coordinators and plus and lastly we are really lucky in our office to have actually the state coordinator for north carolina and his name is david glenn so if you have any questions regarding about kokoraz for eastern north carolina or for the state of north carolina uh feel free to email one of the regional coordinators or the state which is how call it david glenn for any other parts of the country uh, please um, look, go into the website of uh, kokoraz.org and you can find how, who is your regional coordinator and your state coordinator. So this is a simple um, outline and this is what we're going to be actually talking about today. Um, first, we're going to start off with what is Kokoraz and move over to a brief history and the main mission of the organization. Then third, we'll start off with who uses the data. Then we'll move over to setting up your rain gauge and measuring precipitation. Four, we'll start, I'm oh, sorry, five, we'll start off with how, call it, how to report observations. And last, any of the frequent questions that people ask, um, that have, uh, sorry, frequent questions that people have. And at the end, we'll actually take questions um, from you all. So what is Kokoraz? Well, simply, Kokoraz is a grassroots nonprofit organization that's made up of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds. Okay, you simply just make a daily observation or sorry, measurement 
of precipitation right in your own backyard simply using a four inch rain gauge. Uh, once you are trained, um, you know, most likely either you plow the rain gauge, a four inch rain gauge, or will be purchasing the rain gauge. But here is a picture of a rain gauge right here. Um, let me just turn on my pointer here. Uh, this is one the um, gate, uh, the certified, you could say, recommended um, rain gauge that Kokoraz actually uses. And if you want to, if you are a weather weenie in a sense, or a really weather geek person, you could go a beyond higher and actually get one of these pads right here, these aluminum foil wrapped styrofoam pads uh, for areas that have tend to have a lot of hail. And you simply just at the back, if you turn it around, there's actually um, the name. Obviously, you put your name, your Coco Ross um, ID number, and say approximately what time reference uh, this hail actually occurred and what date it occurred. So, and you can send that over to actually the headquarters of Coco Ross. So the history of Coco Ross. Well, Coco Ross all got started out in Colorado, simply. Okay. Who actually started it was actually the Colorado Climate Center at the university, uh, sorry, at Colorado State University back in 1998. All thanks to basically a major rainstorm that caused flat flooding in Fort Collins. Okay. Uh, a state climatologist there said, hold on, there's, you know, why there was a large variability of climate, uh, sorry, of rainfall across the area. He wanted to do something about it. So from there, he started getting rain cages, and then from there, it really expanded out to the 50 states, including Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, now internationally, Canada and the Bahamas. North Carolina became part of this network back in September of 2007. So what is the main focus for Kokoraz in regarding about Precipitation. Well, the reason of Kokoros and the reason for these trainings that you're, you're seeing today is basically to train you so you can start observing quality precipitation data. And also, there's additional educational opportunities uh, for this. Uh, if you want to know more about educational opportunities, go into the website to kokoros.org and you will see uh, there's webinars there that they actually do. They have additional trainings. They have YouTube videos. Um, more to expand, if your teacher uh, gives you actually uh, some lesson plans and some lesson ideas to educate your students. I know the situation's a little different now, but you know you could probably be really creative looking what they have to expand on your educational um, aspects for your students. So as I mentioned to you before, why Kokoraz? Well, as I mentioned during the Fort Collins um, event, there was a large variability of rainfall. One spot had about two inches, another spot only had a half an inch, while one spot had basically, you could say, you know, seven inches of rain. Um, as you can see in the left-hand side, you hit, there's a picture of a, of a person taking from the airplane, and you can see how much a downpour is occurring in one specific spot while the area is receiving sun. And this is how spotty things can be. While other parts, well, there's too far between of data sources, meaning uh, rain gauges across the area. So it's really hard to determine what areas actually did get rain and what other areas that did not get no rain. So here's a prime example that I love showing to people here. This is when I, uh, I just recently got to North Carolina and we had a, uh, basically a sea breeze uh, thunderstorms. All right, and typically occurs in the afternoons. And the sea breeze moved in and just basically stalled right over the Havelock area. And just within four hours, you received almost nine inches of rain within four hours. While you see the area across, you know, across the area, areas just got about, what, well, just to the north, maybe, you know, a half an inch to maybe, you know, two inches as they get closer south. And then just along the coastline, right here, um, you can see about, you know, two, maybe to five inches. So it just shows how important having a Kokoraz uh, rain gauge can actually help fill in some of these gaps, especially this. If we didn't have this rain gauge here, 
I don't think people would have known that nine inches of rain fell in that particular spot. So this is why we're actually promoting and educating people how important having rain gauges, which is ground truth for us, is important to have. So who uses Kokoros data? Well, us, like the National Weather Service, us meteorologists. We look at this data all the time. Uh, other meteorologists throughout um, the country, hydrologists, emergency managers, you, uh, city utilities, like kind of the, um, just, um, sorry, the water centers, um, USDA, scientists just to study how call it, you know, mosquito control, um, farmers, they look at this information. So this information is really extremely useful. And now, after so long of doing these type of trainings and how quality control has become such an important essential for Kokoros, now everyone's data is actually published in the climate books now. So that's kind of the, the good thing. So let's move on to more of the training. So as I mentioned, let's set up your rain gauge and measuring precipitation. All right, one of the things and it's extremely important is the placement of your rain gauge, okay? The better the location, the better quality data that you're gonna be getting. All right, everyone. But let's not place your rain gauge, how call it, underneath the, the gutters. I don't think that's well representative, okay? And also, worst place, not in the box. If you get it shipped, please take it out, use it, start setting it up, okay? So trying to determine where to put it. Well, let's start off first, where not to put it at all, okay? I know it's really convenient just to, you know, put it right outside your desk. I know it's the easiest thing. You can just wake up, walk out with your cup of coffee and just take one thirty. Nah, it's too close to the house. That's the issue. The other thing is, let's not put it underneath the tree, especially during the summertime when the trees, I call it, have their leaves growing and everything. Like right now, their leaves are trying to grow because it's spring. It's going to obstruct, I call it, rainfall getting in. It's going to kind of you know, use it as a kind of like a, a shelter in a sense. And also kind of obvious, let's not put it next to a sprinkler system because that's really gonna kill your, your observations for precipitation. And then also, if you know you're in an area that has a lot of wildlife or if you have a dog, let's you know, be mindful where to put it because you don't want your dog or cat or the deer or the bear, especially for Eastern North Carolina to you know start um, attacking it or destroying your rain gauge. Um, this is one of the mistakes I made. Um, this is when I was a young college student, um, didn't know any better. Um, the first rain gauges I ended up getting was I put it on the gate. Yes, I thought it was a bright idea, but it ended up being the wrong thing. Um, try to avoid setting up your rain gauge um, basically on your fence or winning gates or anything. Um, the reason being is because you want to avoid any artificial increases or decreases on your on your rain gauge. And what I mean by that is basically the wind. As the wind is coming, it's blowing, it's going to go upward as a result um, because it's seeing this fence. So it's going to be going up. So whatever precipitation is coming down right here, okay, let me put this on um, my pen. So whatever precipitation is coming down, okay, coming down this way, the wind is going to come, as you can see, and push that rain out. So whatever rain you have here is going to be coming this direction, right over here. And we don't want that. We want to get the actual observation. We want the rainfall to fall right into the rain gauge, not away from the rain gauge. So here's some ideal um, places to put it. Well, simply, if you have a home, you could put it in your garden. Um, that's where I actually have mine. It's located right now. It's in the garden. Gives me an idea how much rain actually fell in my garden. So it determines how much water I need to water it on a very hot summer day. Or simply in a rural area, just an open field area simply, okay? But for those who are more in the city, um, try to do your best in what areas because there's a lot of buildings, trees, a lot of structural things around you. 
But if it ends up being a little bit on the difficult side, well, you can actually put on top of the roof in urban areas. So put in your rain gauge. Excuse me. Put in your rain gauge on the roof right here. It's still okay because you're still getting observations. Everyone deals with this issue. Okay, how far away from my house? All right, so I know everyone has trees, bushes, um, maybe a tall building next to our house. I don't know. It all depends where you live. You know your area. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in an open area, strive to be twice as far from the obstacle as high they are. So simply for an example, if your house is approximately 15 feet tall, put your rain gauge 30 feet away from your house if you're able to. That's just an example what I mean by that. Or if you have a tree that's roughly, you could say 20 feet tall, try to move it away 40 feet. I hope you get what I mean by this. But if you live in a developed area, strive to be as far as possible from the obstacle as they are high. So just try and do your best. And if you have trees, just like here in North Carolina, we have plenty of trees everywhere. Well, simply as you can see in this photo right here, do an equally distant, okay? Try to put it right in the middle. So an area that you can see that the foliage, oh, sorry, the foliage, the leaves will not interact will not interact with the rain gauge you know avoiding the um sorry allowing the rain to get into your rain gauge excuse me also how high from the ground well in an open space you could put it two feet above the ground that's fine but you normally, when you have areas that are open space, you tend to get a lot of more wild animals getting to it. In developed areas, um, you can place it as probably five feet above the ground. Um, I actually have mine set up at five feet above the ground. Even though I'm a little bit of a mix of city along with rural, I kind of want to do it as I tend to get a lot of deer in my area. So the ideal place, for me, in my opinion, to avoid any wild animals, cats or dogs, deers, bears, anything that you could think of, coyotes, I think it's best to put it at five feet, in my opinion. So when you're setting it up, make sure that your gauge is leveled. You don't want it sideways, okay? because then you're not gonna get the right amount of rainfall into your green gauge. Also, when you're putting a post up, try to have the top beveled. And this is what I mean by beveled right here. It's beveled, basically a 45 degree angle. You don't want it to have it topped or basically leveled off. And the reason why I am saying this is because if you don't cut this piece off, when it rains, okay, you're having rain falling in here and getting down, but rain will fall here and then kind of bounce right into it and that's the reason why you try to do a 45 degree cut right here to avoid it jumping into the rain gauge because then you're getting an increase of rainfall into your rain gauge and if you have any questions feel free to put it up and we'll answer those questions towards the end okay Measuring rainfall with your gauge. And of course, as I mentioned, we want to do it as accurately and consistent as possible every time. So this is what your rain gauge will look like when you get it, when you order it, okay? The circumference here is four inches. This is why it's called the four inch rain gauge, okay? The circumference of the inner tube is actually one inch. Your inner tube, your inner tube right here, could hold up to one inch, as you can see. 
and the outer tube, this right here, will hold up to 11 inches. All right, hopefully that's visible right there, 11 inches into gut. Um, so uh, for this area that we tend to get a lot of tropical storms or severe weather, uh, for severe weather, I think this would be ideal during a tropical storm. Well, I think it all depends on the situation of a tropical storm and where it's actually directed. I know during Hurricane Florence for us here in North Carolina, uh, because of how significant it was this event, um, the Kokoras gauge was not sufficient. Um, oh, it wasn't sufficient for me. I had Kokoras and I couldn't even get a real value um, due to you know, it exceeded the 11 inches. In my house, roughly, I got about 24 inches of rain, roughly. Um, but <clears throat> obviously it's gonna exceed it, but just try to do your best. If you have a significant event, be safe. Let's not go out there in the middle of, you know, 100 mile per hour winds. Let's not do that. Try and take an observation, okay? Um, so just be mindful when you're taking observations. You know, safety is always first as well, too. I just kind of want to mention that. <clears throat> so when you take an observation, there's always that word about decimals. All right. I'm not, I'm not sure if you like decimals or not, but I love math, so I have no problem with decimals. But when you're taking observations, okay, please be careful when you're recording your measurement. Getting that decimal point correctly is essential. Okay, it's a big difference when you have a 0.40 inch of rain versus four inches. That's a huge difference. Um, so they will be picking that up. I will be picking that up. Um, when you send out your report in the morning, I can see that. So don't be surprised for Eastern North Carolinians. If you see an email from me, that'll be because, or for one of my other coworkers, it's because we noticed uh, you didn't place your decimal point on the correct spot. Okay. Also, do not round up. It's very important to record your observation to the nearest hundredth of an inch. Do not round up, okay? Just because you got an observation of 0.98 inches doesn't mean you got one inch. You could verbally say, yeah, I almost got one inch of rain when you're talking to your friends. But us scientists, we want to the nearest one hundredth of an inch as accurate as possible. Also, what time should you take your observation? Well, everyone takes their observation at different times. You can take it whatever, but Coco Ross kind of wants you to take your observation around seven o'clock in the morning. It's just the ideal time. And the reason being is because that's when people are just ready to leave to go to work, roughly, give or take. I know everyone has different work hours, but seven o'clock is kind of the preferred time. But if you can't meet those hours, you go start as early as <clears throat> 4.30 in the morning until 9.30 is perfectly okay. We take, I take my observation roughly around eight o'clock in the morning. So any other times can be accepted, um, acceptable. You just gotta note it once you so, um, sign up. So reading your rain gauge. Here are some of the most in common situations what you will encounter. All right, there will be days that you will not get no rain. So simply go into your app or onto the website, log in and just put in a zero observation, okay? A zero observation is a report, okay? That's really important for us meteorologists, the hydrologists, the very forecast center, people um, who are doing research, that's a valid, have an observation because that's what actually happened. It's really important. For example, here's during uh, the Texas drought back in 2011, if you remember this. This is after several days of not having rain, okay? You can see in the bottom left-hand corner how dry the fields were getting. So a, a zero report is very valid and very important. It does help out the meteorologists, and all the other people that I ended up mentioning just a few seconds ago. Also, there'll be times that you'll just get, you know, a little sprinkle, okay? Only a few drops, 
that fell into your ring gauge or there's times when you get those few little drops it might not even make it to your ring gauge just because how sparse it was but you can still put that as a trace if you actually saw it rain just a little bit just you know a little drizzle okay so trace is an observation also there's gonna be times that you're gonna be getting a little bit more than a trace you're gonna be getting somewhere between a, tr a trace to uh one tenth of an inch um right here this person ended up getting getting basically zero point zero four um so that's an accurate reading right there just by looking at it <clears throat> Also, you're gonna get this um, haka, um, this little um, lens image, uh, meniscus. All right, that's basically when the surface of the water in the rain gauge looks a little curved, or you can say a lens. Um, so how you go about reading this? Well, I'm gonna show you right now with using my pen tool. You basically wanna read it from the bottom of the lens. Okay, try to make it as bottom of the lens right there okay so let's say for example it's 0.40 so it was actually a 0.40 um so you want to get it right at the bottom of that curvature and here's just um some other images um basically this is a half an inch and this is what's going to look a half an inch right there and then the sorry <clears throat> and then you're going to get one inch. So what happens if you get a lot of rain that exceeds more than an inch? Well, that's going to be something. So basically, when you get more than one inch of rain, basically, it's going to go into the overflow. As you can see in the bottom on these gate on pictures, <clears throat> you're going to see that rain fell and came out over the one inch tube in here and start collecting on the outer tube. As I mentioned before, this whole gauge covers up to uh, basically 11 inches in general. So you got 11 inches. So how you take these observations here? Well, simply is <clears throat> you pour out your, your one inch from the inner tube and write it down on a piece of paper, okay? If you have your cell phone, get the notepad and just write it there, okay? Or just type it in there, that's what I was meaning by. Then, get the funnel and put it over the inner tube on top okay as you can see here here's the funnel and here's the inner tube then you take the outer tube and then gradually and slowly pour into it okay try not to get as close to the one inch um, normally um, when that happens and i have made this mistake myself because i'm human that it has overflowed and right there, I just missed a few hundred, hundredth of an inch on uh, that fell on the ground. But try to go below the one inch mark. That's what I best recommend. Stop, you pour in, you stop, take the reading and write it down on the piece of paper or on your notepad on your smartphone. Then repeat the steps again until all the water is out of the outer cylinder. Then you simply add up everything. As you can see on this new slide that I just presented to you. So you simply just add it all up. So this person basically had 3.77 inches of rain. As I stated, if you have any questions, go ahead. Save, just write it down, save it at the end, and we'll answer you when we open up all the mics. Or feel free to ask how call it on your tab on the question. No one will see it. <clears throat> all right, so now I'm going to move over to Eric. So Eric can actually start talking about significant weather reports, another way to report how call it um, significant events. Eric, by all means, take all it right. away. 
Thank you so much, Bell. I appreciate it. Um, appreciate everybody for joining us uh, for this presentation this afternoon. Um, one thing I want to follow up with, Bell mentioned the ability to ask questions through the chat. Uh, we did get a question earlier from Rance. Uh, I answered him directly, but for everybody else, you might want to kind of know, what does COCORAS mean? And I told Rance that actually stands for the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. So uh, we did get a question on that. At any point, ask a question. We'll take most of them um, at the end because we're going through the presentation. Um, Bell also just mentioned, you know, if you get more than an inch of rain, write it down. Um, in those times that we're forecasting heavy rain, you may have to empty it out a couple times. As she mentioned, you know, with Hurricane Florence, we got a tremendous amount of rain. Um, safety always comes first. If we have a regular normal rain where we're expecting a couple inches of, of rainfall, you may actually have to empty it out numerous times, depending on how much rain we actually get. So the next couple slides, we're gonna go over other types of reports you can make, then we're gonna wrap things up. We like to keep this pretty short and sweet, uh, so we'll keep you on track. Uh, so she focused mainly on rainfall measurements. You can also submit a significant weather report, and you would do that by clicking on the form and these are things like um, maybe especially heavy rain or snow falling this will come directly to the weather service so bell mentioned reporting every morning between seven and nine that's your normal precipitation report but if you get a significant event uh, that occurs we want to know about that right away and you can use that significant weather report on the website itself so that's very very useful these weather reports come to us directly at the office so in this example up toward massachusetts they got an inch in 15 minutes time of course you're going to report that next the next morning and that's good info to know but we want to know about that type of uh, event right away so anything significant truly heavy rain uh snow use that significant event report or weather report, and that will go directly to the office. It actually pops up on our screen automatically. We also wanna know about hail. The majority of the time here in Eastern North Carolina, you're gonna be measuring rain. Sometimes during severe weather, you are gonna get hail, and we certainly wanna know about that as well. Uh, so you can send those reports in. Um, you don't have to have a hail pad. Bell mentioned um, kind of that foil pad in the beginning. If you have one, great. Uh, if not, just knowing the hail size is important. With our online classes, we always talk about doing an exact measurement of the hail or using a reference. It's as large as a coin, uh, as a quarter, as a penny, and so forth. So we do wanna know about hail measurements as well. Again, you're not gonna be doing that as often, but it's still good information. This is a program where we want all types of precipitation reported. One of those is snow. I know a lot of folks, Bell, as we head toward the first day of April tomorrow, don't want to talk about snow anymore, but occasionally we do get snow. There's a couple ways you can measure snow. We're going to go very briefly through this because we're going into the spring months. On the website, cocoaraz.org, you can get much more information if you want to know more in depth in terms of measurement. First thing, we want to know about the liquid content of the snow. So you're actually going to take um, your inner tube out of your gauge, the top part out, so that you have the four inch opening to collect your snowflakes. And you're gonna add a known quantity of hot water to melt the snow down. Then you're gonna measure it all and subtract out that known quantity of water. That gives you the liquid content of the snowfall. Again, more in depth on the website. The other thing we wanna know about is the actual snow depth. The reason why we're going quickly through this, we're going into spring and you're not gonna be doing this, hopefully, until next fall or winter. You can, again, learn much, much more at the website, cocoraz.org. I should mention, you will all be getting a certificate after this class. With that certificate, I'm also going to um, provide some links, which will be things like Raws and how you can get this updated information. The second section is gonna talk a little bit about the website itself. Um, I personally prefer the app, and we're gonna talk about that. But once you get your rain gauge, you fill out the form, uh, and you have a, um, an observation or station number, this is what the website looks like. It will default to seven, eight, or nine o'clock, whatever you choose, uh, chose for your observation time. Um, and how much precipitation did you have? Most of the time, as Bell mentioned, you're gonna be met just saying zero. In the last couple of days, we haven't had rain. A night like tonight or tomorrow morning, you're going to be measuring the rainfall. Here, you can do an observation note as well as snowfall. At the website itself is how you'll log in. 
Uh, at the very top, you can log into the website and you can remain logged in. So if you do the same browser, you can kind of come back to the same place uh, every day. I used to use the website. It's great. It's useful. Uh, but I will say now that I have the app, I definitely prefer that. When you do your observation, you can click on My Data. Uh, there's your, again, date and time. Um, the section on the middle for rain and melted snow, that's where you're actually going to be entering your observations. So in this case, um, this 0.59 on the field, that was your actual observation. And then just leave it NA for snow. Uh, that will get you through most of the year for here. Record your measurement to the nearest hundredth of an inch. Remember, Bell said don't round up uh, and be careful of the decimal. 0.59 inches, a little more than a half of an inch of rain, is a lot different than 5.9 inches of rain. She was real clear with that, so make sure you're careful with the uh, decimal place. As far as extra observations, you can leave this section blank, but if you want, you can add more um, information there. Hey, we've got quick thunderstorms and what happened. Um, she mentioned all the entities that look at this information. As far as a researcher goes, that may be extra information that's useful to them, especially when they're not um, up with the day-to-day -day weather when they're looking back. Once you're done, you hit submit data. I talked about it for a minute or two. In theory, this takes you 30 seconds or less to do that. If you want to see the observations, you can go to the website and look at, at it on a state view uh, by clicking on the United States and the state that you live in, and you can zoom in itself. One thing I like to do as a gardener, I like to sort it by my county. Uh, in this case, it's out in Col Colorado, just to see what the folks around me are measuring. Uh, how much rain did they have compared to myself? It's kind of neat to see how much rain fell out. A couple other important reports, uh, hail, significant uh, weather that we did, and multiple day. Uh, hail report, same type of thing. On the left, instead of the daily precipitation, you would just click on hail, and then you would tell us what was the size of the hailstone um, from smallest to largest. So it's very, very useful there. Monthly zeros are really good. Let's say you didn't hear Bell and she said and a zero report is just as important as rainfall because again, you might say, well, yeah, I know it's dry. Doesn't everybody know it's dry? Not to the researcher that's looking back maybe a couple years through the data. So be sure to enter your zeros. If you forget and you need to do it all at once, you can do the monthly zeros tab on the left and click off on the uh, days of the month that you know it did not rain. So again, zeros are really important. If you don't enter something, we can't assume it was zero. We can only assume that it's unknown. So that really emphasizes zeros are important. Significant weather, again, that tab is on the left as well. Click on that. Uh, and then you can also do a multiple day um, precipitation report. Let's say you're away on vacation. When we get back to normal, that's probably one of the first things we're all gonna wanna do, go on vacation. So you come back to your home, uh, the Coco Ross gauge says that you had, you know, in this case, 2.15 inches of rain. You can enter that in as a multiple day precipitation. You don't know what day it fell on. You don't know if half the days were dry. So you just enter a first and last day when you actually emptied it, and that will go in uh, as good data. So again, um, the opening of the rain gauge is very, very small, especially when you consider the funnel at the top. So you won't get a lot of evaporation. So a multi-day report is good. A couple of frequently asked questions, then we're going to turn it over to you for any questions that you might have. And I see we've got a question from Will and Ty uh, in the chat room. So we'll get to you in a second. Do I have to be home every day? No. We do want you to report as often as you can, but we understand that work comes up, school comes up, people get sick, you go on vacation. So just do it as often as you can. And like I said, use that multiple day report um, if you're gone for a while so we know um, what happened when you were gone. What if it hails when you're not home? We still um, want your hail pad if you have it, so report as much information as you can. If a friend or neighbor uh, can confirm how big the hail was, uh, you can use that report as well. Do I report morning dew that has collected in the rain gauge? No, dew is not precipitation. Um, we will see this a lot, right, Bell, in eastern North Carolina with the humidity we have. It seems like it rained half the time in the summer because it's so humid out. We've got dew all over the place in the summer months. Don't include that as precipitation. You can include it in the comments. Hey, we had another morning with heavy dew, uh, something to that effect. But dew is, does not count as precipitation. How long is your commitment once you sign up? 
ideally at least a season, but the longer you contribute, the more valuable the data is. So the example is if you do it for a season, that's great. And then if you stop, then we don't have any data going forward versus somebody that does it year after year, we can look back and observe trends and changes in our climate. The longer period of record we have, the more accurate we can look back at our climate history. So um, as long as you can commit to us, we would appreciate it. Here's probably one of the most popular questions. Hey, I've got an automated weather station. Can I use that instead of the Coco Ross gauge? And this is a really good example. They've got the post, they've got the four inch rain gauge there, and they've got a weather station on top. And these weather stations are really, really good. Um, they, they have wind and temperature and rainfall. But in order to accurately compare Coco Ross reports, we really want everybody using the one on the bottom. So not a personal weather station. We really want you to use the four inch rain gauge. The reason for it, the personal weather stations are, are good, but they use a mechanism that makes them digital called a tipping bucket a mechanism. And during a normal soft rain or most rains, it's, it's fine, it, it's pretty accurate. Uh, we use them at the weather service. But during very heavy rainfall, they will tend to underestimate. Because of that, the four inch gauge is preferred. So I know a lot of you that might be weather enthusiasts may already have a weather station, please get that four inch rain gauge because we want to be comparing apples to apples with our rainfall measurements. Lastly, as we wrap things up, I highly, highly recommend the app. Uh, it is on the website itself. In fact, let's just pull that up um, before we um, finish this up. Oop, we'll discard that. So I'm going to hop out of here before I finish the presentation bell because I want to show them the website. So it's cocoraws.org. Um, I'll show about the app and then we'll hop back in the presentation. This is where you can sign up. This is where the training is. You've already been through the training, but if you need additional training, if you scroll down on the page, um, this is where you can find it in Google Play or the App Store. Awesome app. From the comfort of your mobile device, you can quickly um, you know, send those reports in. And again, 10 seconds, it'll take you longer to walk out to your gauge than it will be to enter these reports. If you wanna purchase a gauge, uh, it is on this website. They have various vendors. It usually runs $30 to $35. Um, sometimes I would price check it with Amazon as well uh, just to see what the better price was. So anything you need is on this website from joining to future training to the app and also purchasing the gauge. I can't say enough about the website itself. Uh, it's really uh, tremendous. Two more slides for additional resources I mentioned. Um, the website itself, Bell is one of the coordinators, so you will get messages from the state coordinators as well, and they do a really good job to put out information. They have a message of the day, they have a blog, a newsletter, uh, that will be sent to the email that you signed up with. So if you don't uh, get information, if you're not getting information, make sure that you signed up with the correct email and there's no misspellings or anything like that. So we're gonna wrap things up here. Uh, you're ready for precipitation. Belle's email is at the bottom. She's one of the coordinators for our office. Um, Belkis Melendez at noaa.gov. As I mentioned, you will be getting a certificate from us. With that certificate, I have a whole list of links, uh, Coco Raws, where you can find information that will be in your email. So if you missed any of that, we went too quick with any of that, uh, you can certainly review that here coming up.